Hey guys and welcome back to another live stream and Simplify Gardening and in today's episode we're going to be talking about sowing those seeds so that you can get success in your garden and a lot of you will know there's a lot that goes into this uh, you know beginners will think that it's just a case of throwing them down into some compost and having done with them and it's not about that at all there's certain things that we can be doing to make our lives not just easier but get more likelihood of a good germination without the after effects of any disease and everything else so before we go forward as always um, at the top of the chat where you've got top chat and live chat if you click on there there's a Q&A page as well you can go in there and put any questions that you have in there and we'll get to um, putting everything in there as we go um, so before I do go ahead I don't know um, if um, this person's in here uh, last week, I actually missed uh, a live chat that came in, uh, you know, w one of the live chat things. So um, this was uh, for a £5 donation and I wanted to cover that and apologise for that. And that came from Ben for Ben, who uh, done one of the super chats for £5. And they just wanted to say that they had raspberries in containers um, with a tray underneath that caught the water. And because they had 1,200 litres of stored water, they didn't mind that so much. Um, so it's more of a statement, really, than a question. But um, I just wanted to make sure that I shouted this person out. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, Ben for Ben. Um, so if you do come on in the chat, make sure you put it in the um, in the chat for me so that I, I'll get to know you a bit better. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I shouted them out. Uh, I really appreciate you supporting Simplified Gardening channel uh, by making a donation. Anyway, let's get back to it. I can see um, there's loads of people. So Rob's telling me my sound is out of sync. Uh, Rob, I'm really sorry for that. It's all looking okay here. So I don't know if YouTube is having a few issues, um, but let's hope it'll sort itself out as we go. Um, turn the volume up so Amelia saying the volume is low as well bear with me one second how's that Amelia is that better um everybody else is saying it's fine all looks good uh quiet also um so let me know how that goes I've got to be careful that the mic doesn't end up clipping guys so um I'm I think I'm pushing it quite high at the moment so i just uh, we'll see how that goes and hopefully you guys can hear me if not i'll get a little bit closer to the microphone um so sowing seeds there's just so much that we need to get ready for now some of you will have already been sowing things like your chilies and uh, you know your onions and your shallots and things like that but you know we are now coming into the next sort of four to eight weeks of constant sowing and um, there are some things that we can be doing to make it easier and the first of those is thinking about the climate that we're doing now we're all unlike me um, wanting to cut back on the electric and everything else that we have at the moment because it's just really expensive isn't it you know we're paying four or five times the price that we were like only a year ago is crazy um, but saying that, I still think that if you're growing seeds or raising seeds to grow your own food, then it's still money well spin, uh, spent. So I still have a few small propagators going, but they are going to be used slightly differently this year. Whereas normally I would leave plants get in there for a lot longer. Um, what I'm using them for is just germination and then the plants are going out. Now with that, we do need to think about when we're sowing and the climate that we're sowing. So the weather conditions and things are going to play a big part. Now, if we are going to be getting huge frosts and things like that over the next coming months, then you need to be a little bit more uh, forward thinking in what you're going to be sowing and how early you're going to be sowing. Because normally we probably sow tomatoes about now. But once they germinated in there, I'm going to need them in the lights and things. Well, I don't want to be doing that. So I'm going to hold off on tomatoes and stuff. So 
the weather conditions can play a big issue for us but not only that the temperature you know there's things we can be doing with um things like our compost for argument's sake you know ideally we want to bring that into a warm location to warm it up because if you sow your seeds into cold compost they're just going to tighten up and they're just going to sit there that compost is going to take forever to warm up whereas if you get that compost warm and then sow your seeds it's going to make a big difference and the same thing with watering when you're wetting that compost down you want that water to be much more uh, warmer than like outside rainwater now um, this is the one exception I would say you're better off using tap water for watering and that's because of pathogens and things like that when you're germinating seeds you want it as sterile if you like as possible so that you introduce less issues as far as things like um, you know fungal diseases and stuff like that so the soil prep that um, that we're going to be doing, you know, it, first off, we, we're looking at warming that sort of compost. And then we want to be looking at the types of mixes because, you know, seeds of all different varieties will require different composts. Now, you can buy a standard seed starting mix or you can buy and mix your own compost. You can use vermiculites, you can use coir. There's all sorts of different things that you can use. But if you can provide the best seed starting mix that that particular variety of plant needs they have a far better chance of not only germinating but getting through that seedling stage so before we go on let's have a little look at what if is anybody putting any questions um so there's nothing in the qu oh yes this is one from cw uh, hi tony the autopot system i watched the video a while ago did you rate this system and have you already answered i do apologize um yes um that auto pot system was used when i grew the poblano chilies in and the spaghetti chilies and that was when i done the collaboration with sean from chili chump and um i actually won that challenge in fact sean's gone on to do that every year with other creators you know um and and his audience but um the the auto pot system was worked really well and the only thing i would say i had like a hundred liter tank it was attached to um i'd probably set that up and attach it now to a thousand liter tank and then just blow out the auto pots rather than just having six i'd probably go all out and grow all my chilies in them and it might be something i'll set up because i'm doing a bit of work in the old tunnel at the moment i'm going to be removing the peach and the apricot trees out of there very shortly um so uh caitlin and myself are up in the tunnel today just we cut back all the vines and and stuff for the grapevines so we are now going to be pulling that out and we're going to be getting that ready because you guys know the older tunnel is where i do all my sewing and everything so we're just prepping that now ready and obviously we'll get the compost and stuff sorted but yeah the auto pot system worked really well carl um <clears throat> right so basically we you know what we're looking for now is we're seeing that the light is starting now to wane a little bit so you know f five o'clock here it used to be pitch black a week ago and now we're seeing like you know 5 15 5 20 so we're now starting to come out the other side and we are getting a little bit more light and that's the signs that uh, springs on its way the seeds are going to need that light and if we are sowing certain crops now then it's going to be a lot harder for them to get the uh, the amount of light they need for the duration because you might be getting enough light in your greenhouse but it depends if they're getting long enough light can really make a difference between your uh, tomato seedlings fragments getting really leggy or whether or not they'll stay short and stumpy and really develop properly into good seed starts um but you know and and again different plants need different lights you know tomatoes they, they'll sit in there all day long like as will chilies and things like that and you know but the likes of lettuce and things like that well they don't need as much light so you can get them down on the lower shelves you know think about where you're going to be putting these seeds if you've got an area that you're going to put them fantastic if you if you are going to go down the propagators and the lighting roots well that's great you know you've already got everything set up you know uh kp's asking 
I started all of my tomatoes and used ring barrel water. They're just starting to get their second leaves. Should I keep going or toss them and start over? No, don't toss them for God's sake. Keep going. When we're talking about this now, right? Everything that we're talking about is a general conversation, guys, okay? It's what I'm doing here. The problem that you have is you have to take the information that creators like myself are giving you and then you have to look at that information as opposed to your own climate and where you live. Because climates, even in the same locality, can be different because there can be a microclimate there. Now, if you can get away and your tomatoes are going and you've got a way of protecting them or giving them enough light or everything else, then just keep them going. I wouldn't say start now because you've got them going. And it's not a problem if you're using rain barrel, if the, if the seeds are, um, uh, they've germinated and healthy. Once the seedlings are going, that it's fine to, to use that. But what I find is germination can be affected by uh, any small pathogens that typically get, um, you know, the, the water in rain barrels is sitting there all winter long. And um, unless we've had a good freeze like we have now, a lot of the pathogens in that water will survive. So, you know, you, it can affect germination of seedlings, you know, but once they, you know, a good stumpy seedling you're not going to have that problem because the seeds are obviously strong and they've done their thing and you can switch over because rain water is the best for them at that point um but if you're using any again and you know and it's got away and it's no problems then whatever you do don't toss them plants out keep them see them going just be prepared maybe you might want to sow just a few more additional ones um, and just have them come on a little bit later, uh, just in case as a backup. If you've got the seed, um, then there's no problem to do that. So, Turia, how hey, Tony, uh, are you spent mushroom substrate for seedlings, or is it only useful for mulch and compost? So, it really depends what you're growing. Uh, spent mushroom compost um, has had quite a lot of lime put into it, so the pH may be quite high. So, what I would suggest you do is do a quick pH test. So if you, you can get a pH testing kit on uh, Amazon or somewhere like that, and just do a quick pH test to see how much lime is still in, in there, you know, what the pH of that is. Because um, we've had batches of mushroom compost sent to us here, and it's been over eight on the pH scale. It's hugely high. And, um, you know, that's really going to affect you know certain crops so just be mindful as long as you know what the ph is and if it's come down to neutral because sometimes they flood the compost before it comes to to wash it out so it really depends okay just be mindful of it though that it could potentially cause you an issue uh square deal tot hi it won't let me i'm not sure what that's about um if you want to clarify on that uh, Mark Shaw, what potting soil do you use or do you make your own with your compost? Mark, um, I tend to, um, with potting soils, I will use a combination. If I can find a good, excuse me guys, <coughs> if I can find a good combination of a potting soil that's got um, a good gritty mix in it, then I will use that for drainage because one of the biggest issues uh, with fungal diseases is too wet a compost and people are too happy to put too much water on the seedlings now bear in mind you've got this tiny little seedling with hardly any roots certainly no foliage at the time and then you're dumping all this water on as if they're a full-blown plant you know people really the, the compost only just needs to be moist it doesn't need to be you know waterlogged and things like that and people can over water these things so then you get you know, all these fungal diseases, it causes damping off uh, issues and things like that. So um, a good gritted soil is really good for seedlings. And then just go over the top of it with either a very fine dusting of the compost or use a vermiculite or perlite or something like that. Um, a vermiculite I would probably use there though. Um, will it grow? Do you ever make sauces from your chilies? If so, what's your favorite prep, uh, pepper to grow? Um, so um, I don't make sauces out of them. Um, I tend to use them as like a dry chili. And um, the, one of my favorites is the spaghetti um, because 
you know, you get a fairly long pod um, and it's really got a nice flavour that I think, um, you know, we use it here and we make like a powders and stuff out of them. Um, I haven't gone down the uh, sauce issue because if any of you saw the live stream with Sean from Chili Chump when he was on uh, and I'd done that little half teaspoon of sauce, God, it blew my head off. So I'm not a lover of really hot stuff. Um I suffer with um, uh, Bechet syndrome and as a side effect I've got uh, celiac disease as well and because of that one of the symptoms of that is mouth ulcers and when I, f when I find when I eat really really hot food I end up breaking out in mouth ulcers so I tend to stay away from it. Uh, Jay Dixon, for squid a lot. Hi, Tony. When growing carrots in Oakland's 30 litre pots, is it better to water them from the top or the bottom? Many thanks. Um, it depends on the stage of life of the carrot. Um, I, I would probably water them from the top because you can't, you know, then the compost is usually, because the pot is so big, it's going to get sodden in the bottom before it wicks up to the, to the top. So I would water them from the top. Just be very mindful on how you're watering them. Um, you know, you need a really fine spray. You don't want to be saturating them or anything like that. Um, as they get bigger, you could possibly bottom water. But to be honest with you, it's a lot of faff. Um, you know, if you were just growing some seedling, like your normal seedlings, you know, your chilies and things like that. I'd water them from the bottom if possible um, until you get a bit bigger and then once they're established, then water them from the top. But carrots, um, like I said, the, the soil is going to have to be saturated on, in a 30-litre pot before it hits its surface where the seeds are. So um, I would top water. Um, okay, Adam B, how do you keep your tunnel warm to get seedlings to grow? built my greenhouse but struggled getting anything to germinate so there's various options you could go down the um you know the the, the light this the sort of um paraffin heater solutions or you could use gas fires whatever you wanted to use um but that's all getting expensive now uh we made the hundred hour candle that we used for years in the, the tunnel what I would suggest you do though first off is create an area within the greenhouse out of bubble wrap that is going to be a secondary insulated area and heat that small hair area rather than trying to heat the whole greenhouse so if you can't take the seeds in at home then do that <coughs> build that area out of some bubble wrap or even put a wooden frame in there or a cabinet or something like that and just heat that small area Look at the Andrew Dower candle um, video, you know, they're cheap to make and they will more than heat one of those small areas. The other thing, again, guys, as well, I, I think that it's important to note is that people keep a lot of their seedlings way too warm, especially the things like the brassicas and, and that family, okay? They are a cold... Um, climate vegetable and if you keep them in bright conditions i see this a lot you know people going oh my you know my seedlings are really really tall they've got leggy but i've got loads and loads of light the problem is they're too warm so once they germinate they get them out into the cooler area obviously if it's going to freeze that night then they're going to frost to do and things you want to cover them over with some fleece and stuff but the cooler those brassicas are yeah, the slower they will grow and the stronger they will get. And they won't be stretching for the light because of the heat. What you're doing is you're giving them a false sense of uh, the temperature and the shooting off. But they don't have the adequate light then for the growth that they're putting on at the time. All right, so just be mindful with that. <coughs> Hassan Khan. Hi, Tony. How many niche websites do you own? <laughs> hey, Hassan. Um, I have five websites at the moment, Hassan. Um, Simplify Gardening is the main one. And um, I have a pet website. I have uh, an exotic animal website. I've got another gardening website, which will eventually be rolled into Simplify Gardening. And I also have... Um, a website that's uh, all about beekeeping but 
that's just being worked on at the moment. Um, right, uh, Graham Bolton, what have you already sewn, mate? So um, that's come from Graham. At the moment, I've got onions all sewn, uh, broad beans are sewn, chilies are literally soaking in tea at the moment, and they'll be sewn tomorrow. Uh, aubergine will be sewn. <coughs> Excuse me, I got chesty cough here. Um, peas, uh, early peas will be sown, and um, and really that's about it at the moment. But we are about to start now with some of the brassicas, some of the cabbage, collie, um, the calabrese, those sort of things, because they can, like I said, they can sit in a cold polytunnel or greenhouse. They'll do fine, and they'll you know come sort of early spring mid spring they can go out it you know they are quite sort of cold tolerant you know and you can just shade them over with a bit of netting or something if if it's required so you know i've got things going um i've got like onions down there in that propagator and that's only in here because i'm already heating this room because it's my workspace and it's where I got all the tropical plants so it only makes sense for me to have the propagator down in here the heat is hardly on on there because the room is heated and um, so what I'm doing is I'm germinating there on the floor and then they're going up to the polytunnel and they're going on the older tunnel that has the shelving in that you will have seen before well that's got a small built-in area inside it's double skin so I can heat that if I need to and eventually they'll go out onto the trays outside as well so um whatever thing that you know you need to be uh, wary of as well and i've been seeing it a lot lately with people sowing early seeds is the depth they're sowing their seeds people are sowing way too deep with certain seeds now ideally you're looking at around twice the depth of whatever seed it is okay so if you've got a pea you're only talking a couple of centimeters but I've seen people putting two and three centimetres of compost on top of chilli seeds. And it's just, it's too much for them. You know, um, don't get me wrong, they will eventually pull through. But the energy that's being used to do that, and it's not required. Because more often than not, we're germinating the seed. And then we're planting it on into a cell tray or something like that. And incidentally, guys, <coughs> you may have seen me um, back last year doing the video of the cell trays from Oakland Gardens where I parked the fire engine on top of them that's how strong these trays are they are fantastic and they're available in loads of different sizes there's a link for Oakland Gardens down in the description below the code for this month is also there and for those of you who are not already subscribed to my newsletter get, across, get yourself across to the website the, co the link's also in the description and sign up it'll be on the bottom of any of the articles there's a sign up form for the newsletter every single month on the first they send you a new uh, Oakland Gardens code for that particular month so you can get your discounts from Oakland Gardens when you're buying their products as well and they are also about to launch just for reference um polytunnels as well so um you know so for those of you looking for polytunnels they're looking to do that um i think we will probably be launching them on the first newsletter that goes out. <clears throat> Let me just check where I am because I'm I'm losing myself here. Um, Maggie, do you clean last year's pots for seeds? Right. So there's two schools of thought for this. And a lot of people will say, oh, you've got to wash the pots and you've got to uh, make sure there's no disease in them and everything else. Now, personally, my school of thought on that is if you haven't had disease, what is the point in cleaning them to prevent disease if you've not had disease? You're creating work for yourself. And a lot of this goes back to when, um, you know, in this sort of Victorian ages, when they had these big, huge Victorian gardens, they had a team of gardeners with nothing to do in early spring and winter. So the head gardener got them cleaning the pots and on the premise that it would uh, stop a lot of the uh, 
uh, fungal diseases and things like that. But back then, they used to have a lot of problems with this because they ain't gardening like we are now. You know, and don't get me wrong. Yes, I think you should clean your pots if you've had disease, okay? Um, you know, you want to be giving them a good bleach or whatever the case is to disinfect those pots. But if you've had seedlings go through, you've had no damping off disease or anything like that in there, and the seedlings have gone to maturity and they're out in the garden, well, guess what? That pot's had no disease and it's fine to sow straight into again. I see no problems with that. And I think a lot of the issues that people have when they come into gardening is they hear of these things, it swallows their time and it's not necessary a lot of the time. Like, um, you know, I was talking to uh, Scott, who's in the chat here uh, earlier on. And for those of you that don't know, we did a live stream last year um, about crop rotation. Now, I don't think for 99% of the time, crop rotation is necessary in your garden. But we had a conversation about that. You know, there are lots of jobs that people uh, you hear that you should be doing that are not really that necessary. Now, there will be people who will disagree with me, okay, and who will, you know, disinfect their pots to the last nth degree every single year or every single time that they're going to use them. But like I said, if there's been no disease, the only thing that's sat in there is compost. And if we're going to go down that road, do we need to think about not ever using compost again then? You know, so, you know, because there's only a little bit of compost from the last plants and we, we're on about disinfecting this, but yet we're quite happy to put that then plants into the compost bin, recompost it and then plant new seedlings into that. You know, to me, a lot of these sort of old ways um, I've found not to be required, okay? But there are underlying factors of whether you would do it or not. Like I said, disease being one of them. I hope that answers that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Adam B says, thanks for the answer. Would that work in a plastic greenhouse? Um so, yeah, it would. Um, you, you're only heating the air. You're not putting your plastic against a candle or anything like that. So um, what you can do, what I've seen a lot of people doing with these 100-hour candles, because you make them in a glass jar, is they're getting one of these big, huge tins, and they sit in the candle in that. So if it was to fall over, it's contained. Um, and they're putting that, you know, in the middle of the the greenhouse away from the walls and things like that okay uh, but yeah it would work as well <clears throat> um turia uh well do you have any free time tony so busy keeping us educated uh, plus your job then all these websites uh, <laughs> um yeah i've got a team of writers that are writing for me uh for some of the other websites and um uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build teams to make things happen. And the other websites and things are there in order to fund Simplify Gardening, guys. Okay. Um, <clears throat> likewise with the books and everything else. Basically, everything that I have earned through Simplify Gardening or the websites or anything over the past four or five years has been completely reinvested into making Simplify Gardening better for you guys. That's why I'm still in work. Um, eventually, the idea will be that it will be self-funding to the point where I'll be able to quit work. It will supply me with a living wage so that I can do this on a permanent basis. Um, but to do that, it means it's putting other people in work first because um, I think at the moment we have a team of 16 writers now writing uh, for us, um, two editors. Um, uh, we're about to uh, get, uh, we're doing trials at the moment with a video editor. Um, so that will take off a little few more hours off me that, you know, for the main form editing. Um, so there's lots going on there and I know we're off topic a little bit but it's been brought up so I don't mind talking about it but yeah look you know um, I'm doing a lot you know writing the books and, and everything else but it's all to fund my passion which is helping you guys and um, and trying to bring information to make 
things better for you in the garden and sometimes you know for the creators that are in here they'll tell you you know you'll put hours and hours and hours into a video and it'll actually dive you know and don't go anywhere and things and you're just pulling your hair out because you don't realize you know the amount of work that goes into them sometimes or you might get a bad comment or something and you think you know what's the point but you know the the whole thing is um a lot of work because i want to be able to make sure that simplified gardening can continue i mean it was the only way i could fund this room in order to be able to do the live streams for you guys now and to fund the equipment that i have um you know so now you know it's putting people in work which is good in this time of you know this time of thing you know we've got people now where we're regularly playing on it you know daily and weekly and monthly basis um and um if you know if we can bring good into the world and that's what it's about you know okay let's get back on topic so what temperature do you germinate your onions and shallots and leeks at at the moment that's 21 degrees that's where they've germinated and they literally let me grab one and i'll show you what i mean if you can just talk amongst yourselves a minute So this is one tray of leeks that has just come up. Um, the onions are all the same as well. And um, these are going to be very shortly. They're just starting to have the crooks from opening up. They'll be transplanted up in the allotment and they'll be going into the actual polytunnel, not staying under heat because th th it's not going to do them any good down here. And I want the space. Give me one sec, I'll be back. So, yeah, so they germinated at 21, not because they need it. You can germinate onions much, much lower than that. Um, it's only that I have other things in that unit that are germinated, and I find 21 is a, a pretty good temperature to germinate most things. I will turn it up to around 25 to germinate the chilies, though, when they go in in a few days. But that's not an issue because most of that that's in there will come out when the chilies go in. Okay, so that's all of those questions for the moment. So, um, so the timing of sowing we were talking about, guys. And, you know, like I said, think about when you're going to be able to put your... Um, when you... What's going on here? There we are. So think about when you're going to be able to put your plants outside and work back from then. So the first thing you need to understand is whether or not your plant is frost tolerant or not. So if we are talking tomatoes, they're going to be, unless you're growing them outside, they're going to be under cover. So you can add a few degrees um of protection there okay um but it won't protect against frost so if we're still down to frost you don't want to be planting those tomatoes out into the polytunnel that's not got that protection around them all right because you're going to get frost damage it's going to set them back same things with your potatoes i see some people planting potatoes and, and, and i've seen some people putting them in the ground now well what's going to happen with those is we're going to have a warm day, the potatoes are going to shoot and they're going to push their heads through that soil and then a week later we're going to have a frost and it's going to kill all the tops of those potatoes which is going to set them back because that plant now needs to reshoot and push it all out again. All right. So what we're looking at is the last frost date in your area and then we're going to work back from there when it can go out. So if for argument's sake it's quite a hardy plant like a brassica, well, you can get them out earlier, right? They will take a little bit of frost, but not much. So you don't want a week of frosts because that's going to really check them. But if it's just the occasional light frost, then it's not going to be a problem. You can get them out and you can, you know, sheet them over with um, a fleece or something like that. And um, so maybe that's like maybe the middle of march or something maybe the end of march well we want to work back about six weeks from there so when we're going to sow so that would be ideal about now early feb start sowing the seed six weeks of growing out into the garden same thing with the tomatoes if you're going to put your tomatoes out you know at the end of may 
work your six weeks back we'll be sowing tomatoes maybe the end of march beginning of april maybe um it really depends on what you want to do with them now if you're going to supply later or you can supply a bit of um protection then you can do it earlier okay yeah. so it it really depends on your garden and the equipment um and the resources you have available to you so if you've got a greenhouse well you've got a lot more resources available to you over somebody who's just got a patch of land and doesn't have a greenhouse so it's really dependent on what you have if you've got nothing at all you would need to work that six weeks from the last frost date and sow everything around then things like chilies they need a longer growing season so that's something else that you need to take into account how long is that growing season celeriac chilies uh eggplants aubergines whatever you want to call them uh you know um celery all of these things they're really long growing plants so you need to sow those early and you need to find a way of getting them warm enough to germinate and providing them enough light to continue growing without checking them okay <clears throat> So, Mags, do you have to harden off onions and leeks before putting them in the polytunnel? Yes. So, basically, what will happen with them now, I will take them out of the propagator. They will come into this room and they'll sit on a shelf in this room, which is probably around about 18, because the propagator is at 21, is a three degree difference there. And what I will do then through the daytime is I'll take them out into the garage part of, of this, because for, for those of you who don't know, I'm in a garage. This is um, a room I built in the garage. I'll just put them out into the garage section, let them cool down a little bit, bring them back in here, and I'll do that for a couple of days, and then they'll be able to go up into the polytunnel and they'll be fine. All right? Um, but ideally, you know, if you're going to be hardening off, you're going to look at a, a two-week sort of process but i haven't got to do that because these seedlings have only just germinated they're not really that used to it yet i'll gradually do it over a couple of days and then they'll go up there and they will either make it or they won't it's as simple as that all right <clears throat> okay speaking of seedlings there is a battle of when to transplant some say as soon as they pop uh, can be safely done others say after the first set of true leaves then the first two sets your thoughts soon as those right so w when a seedling comes you've got the cotyledon leaves they are not true leaves soon as it pushes the first set of true leaves out that means there's a root system because that's ideally what you need to transplant a root system now you're going to get a root system before you even get your first set of true leaves because that's what's pushing those leaves okay but it's much better to allow them stab to establish to the first set of true leaves before doing that transplant it's not long anyway you know you're only talking a few more days at most before you get them and by doing that you've got a good established root system which will give them a lot more chance now the people who argue for doing it earlier their uh, argument is that there's less root disturbance okay but these plants to be honest with you, the root system isn't that established it's throwing out its main roots uh, stem and all its tertiary roots haven't even formed yet so it's not really a problem so you know wait for that. I, I personally always wait for that first set of true leaves and then i transplant okay Quick question regarding your channel. Is it better to have a business name without your personal name as you have changed over time? Yes, John. <laughs> um, right. So <clears throat> it really depends what your goals are for your channel. If you're um, like you can go and get a YouTube channel and call it Joanne Jensen, right? Okay, no problems with that at all. The problem is is when the YouTube algorithm comes in and they want it to be uh, simplified gardening, for instance, right, has the a keyword within it, okay? It's about gardening. It tells people what it is on the tin. With a name like Joanne Jensen, you don't know what the niche is around 
the channel so the algorithm doesn't actually know it can only take data from the videos themselves and sometimes it doesn't always get that right but there are other reasons for it as well <clears throat> firstly um the the brand you should always build a brand if you can and if later on you decide you've had enough of your business or whatever the case being <clears throat> it's very easy for you to sell that business and i know you don't see it as a business <clears throat> but essentially what you're building is a business it's it has value so but if it's in your name it's very difficult for a company to then take that and incorporate that channel within whatever the case being now i have no uh no issues with um wanting to sell my channel or anything like that um but I wanted to build a brand, something that could be used across all of the networks that wasn't my name, that people can remember. Um, you know, there's lots of reasons for it. Um, but I think unless you're um, blogging about yourself, so you're like a personal blogger, then, in you know, ideally a, a brand name would be good, something that can have keywords attached to it and help the algorithms to know what everything's about in it. Pat Joyce, is it safe to use horse manure that smells a bit of dog poo in it? So when you say smells a bit of dog poo in it, or do you mean has a bit of dog poo in it? Because that's two different things. Um, if it's smelling like any sort of poo at all, it's not safe to use. All right. It's too rich. It needs composting. So what I would do at that point is I would put it through a composting process and compost it down and then use it manure should not smell now i've just had four ton of manure cow manure delivered parts of it are really well broken down and the other parts and it looks like it was just scraped off the yard yesterday so um that will most of that will go through a composting thing the parts that are broken down i'll put out but you should have an earthy smell to it. it shouldn't smell like poo at all if it does it needs composting okay Steve Picton, I'm in Merthyr and thinking of trying some sweet corn. Have you had success or am I looking at the feet? <laughs> Steve, why would you think you're looking at the feet? The only issue you've got in, in Merthyr is, is all the coal up there. Um, right, look, yeah, you're windy and everything else. Just plant your sweet corn in a good block. Um, I have success every year. I'm pulling, you know, probably 60, 70, 80 cobs off my corn every single year and i'm only down the road from you so you have no issues at all just plant them in a block plant them where they're going to get plenty of light but um find a way, way of shielding them from the winds if possible they're tall plants and they will get battered um but if you can put up some sort of shielding um or plant them in a lower level of the garden or something like that then they're going to do fine all right <coughs> don't know why I'm coughing so much today. Let's have a look what we got here then. Do you sow aubergines or prefer grafted? If you do prefer grafted, do you graft yourself? So I've done both. Um, I typically sow. For those of you that saw the photo last year that I put all, all over Facebook of me holding eggplants like this big, you know, huge eggplants. They were just from sown uh, black beauty, aubergine or eggplants, whatever you want to call them, okay? Um, but uh, I'm not adverse to grafting. The thing about grafting is, yes, it's great if you want to get stronger plants, okay? Um, but with some plants, it's not even necessary. You know, I mean, like tomatoes, grafted tomatoes, it's the same thing. You know, yes, you're going to get you know, a good strong plant and everything else because they use like the submarine um, rootstock or something like that. But when you consider some of the tomatoes that I've grown over the years and they've all just been seed, then I don't really see the point. If you're getting the harvest you want, why bother? Um, I'm not adverse to grafting and I've done grafting myself and I've bought grafted plants. Um, 
but they come with a premium and I just don't see, especially this day and age where money is tight, right? Let's, let's call a spade a spade here. Money is tight for everybody. And when you're purchasing things, and I'm not saying, you know, that you won't purchase anything. What I am saying though is, could that money that you would be spending on a grafted um, eggplant be better put towards another packet of seeds for something else that you can plant? You know, um, because sometimes like a grafted plant is going to set you back six or seven quid um, or ten dollars or whatever it is. Um, you know, how many packets of seeds are you going to get for that? Three or four packets of and then all of a sudden you've got a shed load of plants. Um and different varieties as well. I just, I just don't see the, the amount of produce that's come off a grafted plant worthy of the extra cost. Okay, but like I said, I'm not against it, um, and I've grafted loads of times myself. And one of the times I've grafted was when I was going for the giant marrow uh, world record, and <coughs> what I did there was I grafted two rootstocks to one plant. So I grew two marrows and then I grafted them. And when the graft took, I cut off one of the leaders. So the two rootstocks were feeding the one. <coughs> and um, so so grafting has its place, don't get me wrong. Um, but I just, well, to be honest with you, I think, you know, seeds want to grow, you know. Um, and sometimes we can make their life hard, you know. A lot of the problems that, you know, from seedlings dying or not doing well are caused by us as gardeners. Um, and I just think, well, life's a little bit too short. It's easier just to sow seeds and let them do their thing. You know, they're not, it's not like you're getting a crappy yield off them. If they are, you just change a variety. Might not be the answer you wanted, though, Pam. <laughs> uh, speaking of aubergines can they be grown outside i bought seeds but sure they can only be grown in glass they can be grown outside um i know people who've done it and i've done it myself okay um you'll get a much better yield off them uh under cover okay um if you want big fruits and you want plenty of them they need to be under cover but you will get fruits off them outside it just depends on how long a warm weather we have. Okay. Do you have a video or blog post for the propagator you're currently using? Do you know what? I don't, but I'm probably going to write a review about it because these are absolutely brilliant. And in fact, there is a, a, an extra section that goes on that makes it much higher. Um, they're superb. So what I will do... Uh, Maggie is I, I'll write the review on it so you can see um, how well they are as he did and um, I'll also I have to say I've been testing some of the Oakland Gardens heated propagators that they've got in now I don't know if all of you are aware Oakland's are um, changing everything to long life stuff okay really really long life stuff good quality like i said i parked the fire engine on their cell trays they're fantastic um they're part of the container wise um thing and they you know they have all sorts of sizes there they're fantastic and when you take shipping into consideration they are usually the cheapest around <clears throat> but they've come out with a range of propagators heated and unheated and they're really good quality and i'm using some of those already up the house so um i'll be doing a video on those as well over the next few weeks because they are really really good and i think they're, they're not as big as these but they have a few different sizes and um like i said i've had this for years you know and i'm only using it because of its size but i've got the others running as well and i think that you know folks are really going to like them so if you know, if you don't have the budget for them, you know, for this sort of thing, you may have the budget for those, you know. Okay. That was the same one. So we can turn that off. Yes, right, where are we? Okay, irrigation and watering requirements we've covered, fertilizer and soil amendments. Right, okay, so um, let's look, talk a, a little bit then about... Um, 
producing your own seed starting mixes. So when we look at seed starting mixes, we've already touched on this, okay? You want it to be a really free draining mix. And a lot of people, they think they, they like this really fluffy compost and stuff like that. The problem is with this, it's fluffy because it's full of coir and it holds loads of water. Now, if that uh, water doesn't drain out, that's when you start seeing the moulds grow across the top. You get fusarium wilt, you get fungal infections, you'll get damping off. There is tons of issues that are caused by it being over wet. Um, a way you can help to control this, like I said, is to add a lot of sharp sand or something like that, or, or very fine grit into the compost. That will help. Um, depending on the seed obviously bigger seed the better but if you've got really small seed then may maybe mix in some perlite or something that will help with the drainage okay lighten up that mix a little bit and um, also if you've got small seeds going over the top of that with some vermiculite might be better than compost it depends on the seeds like i said i've seen people burying seeds under two and three centimeters of compost and you know and the seeds not even one mil in size and it's like you know it's just too much compost you know there's no need for it and some seeds like lettuce actually require light to germinate so if you're actually burying them under compost the likelihood is you're going to get a real poor germination out of them so just bear that in mind as well so jay uh comes from col b Hi Tony, have you any tips on preparing the ground for planting dahlia tubers and would they do well in 30 litre pots? Um, they'll do okay in 30 litre pots. I've, uh, In fact, I chucked some spare ones in a 30 litre pot last year and they grew well and they took over. The problem was with keeping them hydrated long enough, okay? Um, prepping the soil, they hate clay soils. So if you've got clay soil, dig a load of grit into the soil because they need drainage okay if they sat in too much wet soil the um, tubers that are feeding the flowers or dahlias are going to rot off on you okay and it's usually where you'll find this will happen before the flowers come once the flowers are up you know the flower starts to send its uh, spikes up then you know you you, you landed but um Plenty of grit and they are quite hungry plants. So if you can put in a bit of compost or manure in with them, then that's going to help them greatly as well. Um, I spread chicken poo on my plots and cover with leaves. It's been two months since I did that. Is it safe to plant on those plots now? Um, probably not. Chicken manure is really, and I mean really potent stuff, okay? Um, you want to be rotting down chicken manure for probably about a year. If the plant's roots touch that, they're going to burn, okay? Um, what I would do is, if it's only on the surface, you could plant through it, but the likelihood is it's going to burn your root system. I would probably scrape it off and I would compost it down. Um, I wouldn't take the chance of burning my plants. Now, I do know people who've put pigeon manure on, and again, that's really rich as well, and they've managed to get away with it. But as a rule, it's just way too rich, and it should be composted for at least a year. <coughs> yes, Jay. Um, Oaklands is only in the UK at the moment. I'm working with um, a couple of people trying to get stuff out into the US um, but your government just don't want to play ball with the taxes we want to be able to produce just a single tax code um, but they want us to apply to pay taxes in all 50 odd states which just is a logistical nightmare not only would we just have to pay taxes in all them different states individually it's not where you sell it from it's where your customers are it's an absolute ball ache and you know we just want to be able to pay one set of taxes and you know but um and it's hard doing it from the uk so um we're still looking at alternatives and that's why it's taken so long so just bear with us on that guys all right um right so pests and diseases to be aware of like i said mainly issue with your um 
seedlings are going to be a fungal infection of some sort and that's going to cause damping off and invariably that's caused by a couple of things it's caused by pathogens in the water if you're using a water butt to water seedlings this is why i say ideally you should use tap water just to get the seedlings going once they're going and switch over to rainwater or it could be um you know a pathogen a fungal infection because you've left compost you know absolutely sodden and it's, it's way too wet for the amount of seed that's there you know for the for the age of that seed that's growing and everything else and those fungal infections will then cause damping off and they are your main things to worry about uh, at that stage as they get into the seedling phases then you know like anything else they start pushing up all this new growth inside is not a problem but what you'll have with things like fava beans broad beans you put them out it's got all this nice new growth and then the black fly come and things like that and again but but that's a little bit further on but the seedling side of things is mainly fungal that you need to worry about okay um <clears throat> so appropriate containers and materials for seed starting so i think one of the biggest issues that people have is that they will sow into a way too big a container to start with and the problem is with this is like i said is the fact that soil remains too wet for too long small containers so little cell trays are ideal for sowing into or a small pot in order to sow a lot of seedlings to transplant later yeah keep those volumes small you don't need huge big pots full of stuff for, you know for a few seed okay um keep it small and then move up into bigger and bigger pots as they grow um that way you'll stop all of the issues with like the fungal infections and everything else okay and like i said oaklands have a uh, link below they've got pretty much everything that's long life down there that i'm going to be using because everything i have pretty much is from oaklands because um you know they they'll ask me to test things um in fact they're going to be doing these poly tunnels they've asked me to to put one up and test these tunnels and i can't i just don't have the room to put another tunnel up so um but we will find another way but i happen to know the company they're buying them from and it is a tunnel that i've erected before on somebody else's channel so i know they're good tunnels so that's why i've given them the go ahead to uh, start stocking those tunnels um just for those of you who um who are on the the live stream i've worked with oakland garden since i had five thousand subscribers they've supported the channel for a long time guys um but i am not tied to giving oakland a, a good thing i don't have a, a, you'll know that i've worked with lots of different companies throughout but although oakland's are a, a constant supporter of the channel um the information i give you about their products is true to how i find it i am not obligated in to say their products are good if they aren't but you seeing the results from them like the containers the buckets and things that i grow the potatoes in like when i park the fire engine on top of the trees yeah you don't get that quality you know f and be able to park a fire engine on top of them you know so i you know i'm happy to shout it from the rooftops because they are good quality and i'm using them myself like i said Right, so look what else we got here. Do you think celery planted out will grow okay in clay soil that is often wet? Thinking of digging a trench and adding organic matter, I'm trying to save raised bed space. Celery are a bog plant, okay, so they're not going to mind the wet conditions. Um, so, but I would dig a trench and add the compost anyway because they are hungry plants, but they are essentially a bog plant. So if you're going to go down the trench method, um jenny have a look at uh trench in celery online or google or whatever and um there's lots of different ways you can do it um but they won't mind the you know as long as it's they're not sat in water they'll be fine sorry tony my manure is well rotted but i think a dog has also pooed in it uh shall i get rid no don't get rid just use the manure and if you come across that dog manure then get rid of that but just bear in mind wear gloves 
um, when you're doing it because obviously the um, any sort of uh, meat eating animal okay is going to produce pathogens um in their manure okay that's why we always use herbivore manures okay but if it's a carnivore um manure you can use that i mean we can even use human manures but it needs to be well rotted down and while it's doing that there's pathogens involved and everything else so wear gloves while you're dealing with this stuff as you're chucking it out just keep an eye out for it if you notice it and then pull it out and you'll be fine um but look, you know, at the end of the day, it's just manure. It's not going to, it's going to rot down like anything else eventually. But just bear in mind it's there. Um, but it's certainly no need to, to get rid of all of the manure because of it. Um, so, and the last thing I want to really talk about, guys, is hardening off your transplants or your seedlings. So we've already touched on it a little bit when I was going to take these up. Let me turn Joyce's thing off. Um, we already touched about it a little bit when we were on about the onions earlier on. But when you're um, hardening off seedlings, so the first thing you've got to do is get them away from whatever heat source that you're providing them, okay? So if you've got them in a tent with a candle and it's keeping that at like, you know, 18 degrees or 20 degrees or whatever the case that sort of tent is being kept at, well, you want to bring them down so they're at like, uh, you know, out of that in a you know a protected area like a room temperature area you know and then gradually bring them down if they're in the greenhouse you bring them out away from that heat source so they're a little bit cooler and eventually over a couple of weeks when you've got dry weather you're going to start putting them outside through the day bring them back in at night do that over a couple of periods giving them longer and longer each day till eventually they're out all day they're only in at night and then after about a week of that then they can go out into the garden they're going to be fine hardening off is probably the one mistake that most people make and don't realize it they'll put it out and what it does even if it doesn't kill a plant it checks the growth of that plant for weeks and weeks and weeks and um, once you check the growth of a plant that's when all of the pest species take over because pests tend to only attack weaker plants and um so and it's when they're stressed like this is when you're going to do it but it, by hardening off properly over a period of maybe a week or two and you're doing that in and out so they they are getting that little bit of cold you know colder temperatures throughout the day and then coming in in the night to be a bit protected you know and just have that fleece ready if you need to you know um then you know you're, you're golden so just because they're outside we don't then th think right they're out now we forget about them we need to be looking at the weather now um depending on when they've gone out like lettuce are quite hardy but you'd probably still want to fleece them if major frosts were coming in you know in maybe even like a couple of layers of fleece you know um even the likes of beetroot and things they will all benefit from fleece if we can keep that frost off them and stop those prevailing winds then you're going to have a better harvest in the long run for it um, but hardening off is something that you really need to take your time with and don't rush and it's what new gardeners tend to do a lot they grow it to this like really big because they got excited and they planted it early so they've been dying to get it out but they couldn't because of the weather and as soon as that weather changes it's out in the garden it's planted yeah and that's the problem here you need to do that hardening off process properly and it's why actually um for those of you that saw with the well-being garden i've been building those double uh walled um cold frames because they'll come out of the polytunnel into those for a little while and then they'll come out of there in the daytimes you know and back in and out of that through the night and eventually out into the garden i haven't finished those yet because it's part of the shed build that i need to do but yeah so you know that's really you know what it is about it we just need to consider all of these little relevant factors it's not just a case of grabbing some compost putting it in a tub throwing your seeds in watering it and hoping for the best so guys unless you've got any other questions that's all i really want to talk to you about i'm happy to answer anything if you've got it now put it in the questions box for us um i'm just looking through the comments here i can't really see um 
And as Jay has said, guys, um, I appreciate you supporting us. So, you know, a thumbs up would really appreciate it. So it, it lets the YouTube gods know. Um, I don't know if Ben for Ben is, is in tonight. But uh, again, thank you. I'm sorry that I missed your super chat last week. I do really appreciate it when people support the channel financially because that just enables me to pay for some software or whatever the case being. So... Um, with that going forward, um, I think next week's live is going to be on Friday. Uh, let me just check for you because I wouldn't want to get that wrong. And I haven't got a topic yet. So if you guys want me to talk about something specific, put it down in the description below, in the comments below. And I'm more than happy to maybe look at that topic. So what are we, 29th? Yeah, we can do Friday, but it's going to be at a later time of 7.30 because I'm working days that I've got to get home and everything else, okay? Um, so if any of you have got any sort of uh, ideas for topics you want me to discuss um, or anything like that, put it down in the comment section of the video and I'll go through there and eventually we'll get to everything that, that we want to. But um, I really appreciate you all coming in and spending some time with me today. Um, I'm hoping that you will have learned something from this and that your seed sowing is going to get off to a fantastic start so that you can get the success later on in the season because that's invariably what it's all about, guys. Um, oh, Pammy Clark. Uh, uh, buy you a lot fee. Oh, I'm assuming that's a coffee. Thank you. Um, yeah, guys, I got a coffee link here, as you can see on the screen. If you want to buy me a coffee, I'd appreciate that as well. Um, yeah, so, Jay, uh, any help with white rot? Um, white rot is a pain in the backside. The only thing you can really do about it is growing another space or growing containers. Um, so if you know a particular area your garden's got white rot, then move away from that garden for a few years to allow that to dissipate and uh, die off before you put like onions and things back in that sort of location again okay um so keep them away from it anything to do with the onion the leek garlic anything like that in that in that family keep away from that area anyway guys i hope you've really enjoyed this i've enjoyed chatting with you i will see you next friday and of course we've got all the shorts and and everything else going on and I'll be filming my first proper video this week. So it'll be coming some point either, you know, through this week or maybe into early next week. Anyway, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.